Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming along this evening to listen to my talk. And I hope it will be really exciting and that you'll find a lot of information um, to connect, as Alex said, to many other aspects of, of knowledge, horticulture, food, um, and other things. But I also want to thank Alex and the Ragged University for giving me the opportunity to give this talk tonight and share knowledge. So this will be the story of bees and honey. Um, in the talk, we will first discuss honeybees, what are they, and their important role as pollinators. We'll talk about the nest of the honeybee. That will lead on to um, a question as to how does the nest of the honeybee relate to a modern beehive and beekeeping practice. Then we will, we, our second part of the talk is really about plants, about Scottish bee plants and how they relate to bees and to the seasons. Um, Finally, we'll go on to the third part, which will be about honey, chemistry of honey, what honey is legally, and we'll end by discussing different varieties of Scottish honey. So a little bit about myself. I've been keeping bees and being involved in beekeeping and apiculture for about 10 years now. I hold a number of qualifications. Probably the most important is the Scottish Expert Bee Master, which is the highest qualification in Scotland for, for beekeeping, as well as uh, qualifications to support teaching. Um, I've also travelled quite extensively in Europe to, to learn what's known as honey sensory analysis, which is effectively the art of being a honey sommelier. Um, I'm involved in honey judging, mainly at the Royal Highland Show, uh, the National Honey Show, and also a commercial honey uh, judging um, competition, which is known as the, the London Honey Awards. And this is for large producers to, um, to effectively uh, get their honey, um, to put their honey into a competition and, and have judges like myself evaluate the quality of their honey. Uh, I'm also a trustee for the, the Scottish Beekeepers Association, which is the governing body of beekeeping in Scotland. Um, and I also uh, organise lectures during the winter months, which the next one will be the beginning of next month on the National Honey Show. Um, and also I'm a Edinburgh honey producer, and it would be uh, wrong of me to not tell you that, it's also, that the honey that's been produced by my bees is soft really the highest quality. We've won so many awards, <laughs> Great Taste Awards, National Honey Show Awards, Royal Highland Show Awards. Are you awards. in charge of all those, all, all those awards? No. <laughs> no. No. So we'll start by asking the question, what is a honeybee? Does anyone know which one of these critters is the honeybee? On the right. The far right. The far left. Okay, so the first one is the bumblebee. Okay, now a lot of people before they even keep honeybees don't know the difference between some of the basic types of bees. So this is not some not a daft question to ask. Bumblebees are really hardy. They're larger, they're really hairy, and they have a really deep hum when they fly. Bumblebees um, are more heat there because they're so what you'll notice about the bumblebee is about dawn time, they'll start flying and you'll see them in the morning. You'll also see them up to sunset as well as during the day. That's something that the bumblebee is able to do. Um, this is maybe not the best of friends, but this, the wasp is an, is an important pollinator um, and it's quite strikingly yellow. Now, this third one that looks very much like a wasp, but it's darker, is in fact a honeybee. Honeybees have, uh, the back of the body is called the abdomen. It's got quite a classic banded um, coloration on the back. And depending on the, the coloration between the black, um, um, black bands, you can usually determine um, the subspecies of the honeybee itself or the race of the honeybee. Um, another one thing I would also should mention as well is there are a whole host of critters known as solitary bees and they are quite antisocial 
And unfortunately, because of that, not as much is known about them as the uh, critters that are at the top, which are all social animals. The bumblebee lives in a colony of about 500 individuals in the middle of summer. The wasp has um, several thousand individuals, a cat or 500, or it depends on the species. Honeybees can go up to 50,000 in the middle of summer. Um, solitary bees, they, they live alone and they can pollinate specific flowers. And many flowers have a, a special relationship with solitary bees and are very dependent on them. So they're really important for pollination and a lot of the chemicals used in the environment disproportionately affects them. And that's because they are not, they're basically not living in a community where poisons and toxins can be shared and diluted. And so if they get a big smack of a uh, weed killer or something, it's, um, it's going to cause more harm than it does to larger animals. Um, in what way do the solitary bees look different? There's a whole variety. So this is a leaf cutter bee and it, it's, it's doing some leaf cuttering at the moment. Um, then there's other, other varieties that have different colours. Some have a chocolatey colour to them. Some um, have a different shape. Some are not as hairy. But one thing I will note, one thing I'd like you to notice at this point is that apart from the wasp, all of these bees are hairy. And that's important. So a bit more about honeybees. I mentioned that they're social insects. The honeybee of, of Scotland and of Europe um, is known as the Western honeybee. That's our species. And it's distributed across Europe, Western Asia, and also Africa, the northern part of Africa. There are three castes of the honeybee, the queen, the drone, and the worker. Um, they overwinter together as a colony in, with about 10,000 individuals. Now, that's what makes honeybees special. There's no other social insect that does that, that flying social insect. The wasps all die out except the queen. The same with the bumblebees. The solitary bees die out and they leave an egg to hatch in spring. The so honeybees go together as a society through winter. Um, and the other really special thing about this species is that honeybees are, uh, are really single-minded when they're foraging flowers. And this makes their pollination really effective in comparison to other species. Um, they live also in nature back in the days when there was large forests in Britain. Um, the home of the honeybee uh, is actually in a cavity in an old tree. And that's why you'll tend to find them in old chimneys, or they'll actually swarm into chimneys. Um, the problem that we have in general in Scotland is a lack, not of trees, but a lack of old trees. A lot of old trees have been cut down by councils and because there are health and safety risk. Um, and unfortunately, those are the ones we should be keeping because they have the cavities in them that woodpeckers can live in, birds can live in, and bees can live in. And that, that's what's supposed to happen. So we got that's one of the issues we have. So the only way that you'll see honeybees, apart from the odd uh, feral colony that's in an old building or in a place, managed to find a safe place to stay, most honeybees that exist in Scotland only exist because people keep them. That's how bad the situation is. Um, now, I mentioned that the colony of honeybees go through winter together as about 10,000 individuals. So what, how do they do that? So honeybees actually have enough, they're able to withstand the cold really well. They can go down to minus 30 without many issues. And the reason they can do that is because of honey. Honey is what they make in the summer to survive winter. And they actually overproduce honey. So the honey is used to give them energy and that energy allows them to generate heat. So you see a bee on a flower, what is it doing? In the case of honeybees, the most important thing that bees are looking for when they're out foraging is pollen. Pollen is full of proteins 
lipids, vitamins, um, amino acids, and a whole host of minerals. Pollen is the nutrition of honeybees and other pollinators. It's what bees are made of, is reconstituted pollen. Um, and pollen is the main factor that in, in honeybee health, a diverse set of pollens, i.e. lots of different flowers in the environment is what pollinators require, not just a huge amount of one flower. Um, the second thing that bees go out and search for is nectar. Nectar is sugar water that's produced by the nectaries of flowers, mainly to attract pollinators to them. So this contains water, it usually can contain some special chemicals from the plant itself, but sugars, mainly glucose, fructose, and sucrose, and they can be others. Um, the third thing that bees will go and collect, and you'll see this mainly in spring, is water. In, in springtime, the bees are eating a lot of honey. And so, believe it or not, they don't eat honey raw. They eat honey 50% water, 50% honey. And so they need lots of water to dilute down the honey so they can consume it. The fourth thing is really important for the health of a colony of bees is tree resin. So it's not uncommon to see, especially this time of year, that bees will actually go out and collect tree resin, mainly from white poplar, uh, horse chestnut trees, but any sort of shrub that has a resinous it's giving off resin. They'll go, they'll collect it, and they'll bring it back to the hive. And they'll coat the inside of the hive in what's known as the propolis envelope. Now, tree resin is not directly used by the bees. It's actually used, it's combined with beeswax and enzymes from the bees themselves to produce this wonderful material propolis, which you can ask me later about where the name comes from. But propolis is... Um, is used by bees to, to clog up any drafts that are in the hive. It's used um, if they kill an animal like a mouse that comes into the colony, into the hive, and they can't get out the front door, they will actually encase it in propolis, which stops infection from uh, going into the, into the hive. Um, and it is believed that this is the origin of mummification in ancient Egypt. That the ancient Egyptians were the greatest civilization that kept bees, and their whole society was ordered on the honeybee. And the pharaoh himself was the symbol of the bee. So, uh, the third most important individual in all of ancient Egypt was the grand uh, beekeeper. Second was the vizier who was did all the work for the pharaoh, um, running the country. Now, it's believed that they saw the effect of propolis on stopping decay. And the propolis was one of the main constituents, along with honey, in uh, the embalming of, um, of, uh, of mummies in Egypt. The other thing that is used for a lot um, is, uh, is, is just keep, is keeping, when, when a beekeeper goes into a hive, um, they, they usually, any sort of anything that moves, the bees will use what they, the propolis to stop things moving around. Um, so the, the material propolis is antibacterial, it's antiviral, uh, it's antifungal, and it's used a lot in, um, in medicine. Um, so pollination. Now, I mentioned bees are hairy. In fact, they even have hairs on their eyes. The, think of the bee as a flying pollen brush. By accident, going about its business, it is pollinating flowers. Um, so bees go from, so there's two types of pollination that happens in flowers. The first one is, is simple. It's kind of a, um, a flower can self-pollinate. The pollen from one from the pollen from flower A goes on to the anther, the female part of flower A, and you, be, you get self-pollination. And this is basically creating a clone um, of the same plant, but in an environment that's constantly changing, nature doesn't like asexual reproduction very much. Mm. It prefers sexual reproduction, which gives lots of variation. In, uh, and so one of, the, one of the variants will hopefully survive in the future when the environment has shifted a little bit. 
And that's, that's achieved by pollen from flower A going to the female part, the anther of flower B of the same species, but different plant. So how is that done? We know it's done by wind. You get a lot of plants are wind pollinated, like wheat crops, wheat and barley is wheat pollinated. Um, and they produce tons and tons of pollen and just by random, um, uh, random events in the wind, they become pollinated. Or you can do it in a more targeted fashion using a pollinator. And so the pollinator gets pollen and it gets nectar out of this and the plant gets highly efficient pollination. So the bee will take the pollen from, by accident, from one flower to the a second flower of the same species and will pollinate the female part of that second flower. Now, because bee, honeybees in particular are so single-minded, they only work one species of flower at a time, this, create, this means that you get a huge efficiency. So if you have an apple orchard and you want to ensure that most of the buds on that apple tree are, is pollinated, you would use honeybees. Um, the other pollinators also do pollination, but they're not as efficient because they'll go from species A to species B and that's no use, it doesn't produce seeds. So this is one of the special things about honeybees. So a bit more about the casts of the honeybee. The big one you can see on the left is the queen. She's mainly defined by her large abdomen, which is actually encases her ovaries. She has, she's the only female bee with fully developed ovaries. And in the height of summer, she can lay about 1,500 eggs a day, which is actually more than she weighs. Uh, she has an egg laying machine, and she also has a number of specialized glands which exude pheromones. And that tells the rest of the colony she's there all as well. The drone is the male bee. He's really big compared with a worker. He's got a cigar-shaped body, really strong. He's got massive eyes like ski goggles. He has a higher, um, higher field of vision than a normal worker. He's got a higher resolution of vision than a normal worker. And he's also got stronger, stronger, stronger flight muscles and larger wings. The back of the body, he's also a stingless bee. Instead of a sting, it has an endophallus, which is used for mating with virgin queens. The, the drone, is its purpose is to find a virgin queen and mate with it. And so the fastest drone gets the job done. And uh, it has a wonderful end of life where it explodes in that action and falls to the ground. Um, not a joke, it's true. Um, there's also a lot of, there's not much research come out that I'm aware of, but we as beekeepers know that the drone does more than just um, uh, base, than, than, um, stick around to mate with virgin queens. Because colonies which do have drones, drones are very expensive to have in a colony, by the way. They cost a lot uh, of energy and a lot of care, and they don't provide a lot, apparently, for the colony. But yet, if you give them the chance, one third of all of the honeycomb, the comb that they produce, is dedicated to making drones. And if you don't produce drones in a, a health, it means there's something wrong, generally, with the colony. This is the, the trophy of the colony. And if a colony produces drones, it means all is well, it's healthy, and it's going to go through reproduction, which is ultimately the whole aim. Um, Finally, there's the worker, and the worker is, um, she has the strongest mandibles, strongest jaws. She has a lot of glands that the other bees don't have, and she also is a female bee. Um, the difference between the worker and the queen is that the workers have immature ovaries, and the queen has fully developed ovaries. So, a bit more about this worker bee. The worker does the work and does most of the tasks in the hive. Um, the first thing she does when she hatches is she cleans up her own cell that she hatched out of. She then goes on to clean other cells, then she starts caring for larvae, for the brood. So in beekeeping, we take the language of, I suppose, poultry farmers. The brood is another word for the eggs and the larvae. And the, 
the, pupa the pupating larvae. So basically, before they become an adult bee that moves around, they're called brutes. And we call them that because the honeybees will actually, the adults will sit on them like a chicken does with her eggs to keep them warm. So the colony has to be at 35 centigrades so that they can, they can fully develop with no problems. So the worker does a number of tasks um, from caring from the broods, um, looking after the queen, cleaning the queen, um, they'll then go on to produce beeswax. Yeah. Is, is it right that they're the same size throughout that? Like they're, yes. they're born adult size. That's right. right. Yeah, that's right. right. So because they're insects, and they, you get ecdysis, which is the basically the same process by which lizards and snakes go through. Mm. They do six molts when they pupate, and when they come out of that, they're in their final form, final mm. Pokemon form. Mm -hmm. And, and they, they don't get any bigger after that point. Mm -hmm. um, so they start producing beeswax, and then eventually they'll do duties like ripening honey, creating honey from nectar. They'll do things like cooling the hive, guarding the hive. Um, so the first three weeks of a worker's life is in the hive, and we call these the hive bees. Um, they also, and there is a, a meaning behind why they do these tasks at different stages, and you can ask me that at the end. Um, so the first three weeks is in the hive, and the last three weeks of their life is out with the hive, foraging. Now, a queen will live for about, uh, in captivity, it can be up to seven years. In, uh, in nature, probably two to three years. Uh, a worker in summer is about six weeks. A worker in the winter is six months, and a drone maybe three months. So that's a number from the beginning and end of the chart, but if the bee doesn't change its appearance, that's right. How, how do you know that it's doing these different things in the middle? So, those number of so it's people have marked bees and they've watched them. So you in the observation you point a specific bee and say yes, that yes. And the reason that yeah, and um, the reason that there's an order by age is because the tasks are timed by the development of the worker. Just like humans are not fully developed till they're 21, the liver is not fully developed, the brain is not fully developed till you're 21. Maybe this is older now. I'm not sure. Modern science, but the same with the, the worker bee. When she first is born, she's unable to use her glands in her mouth to produce larval food. That's why she has to wait for the third day to become a carer for the brood, to produce brood food. And she can't sting yet until her venom gland has fully developed. And that's what is stopping her becoming a guard. Um, and the point of them moving on is and they move on. It's a continuum. It's a continuum. But they can go back. If there's ever a problem, like there's a, uh, there's a, a lot of the young workers have died and there's a lack of jobs in the caring for the broods, adults can actually go back and they can redevelop, their, they can basically recharge glands that haven't been used in a while and make them fully functional again. And this happens quite a lot, actually. Um, so can workers become queens? No, no, no. But every worker has the chance to become a queen. Yeah. It depends on what they're fed. You are what you eat. The queen is fed royal jelly all her life, and that's what makes her a queen, makes her a fully developed female bee. And royal jelly has got lots of testosterone in it, lots of sex hormones, as well as nutrition. And that's what allows her ovaries to fully develop. However, the brood jelly, which is produced by uh, produced for larvae, they only get that for three days, and then they go on to a, a diet of honey and pollen. And so... Um, this is the main reason why, um, but also we think there's pre-selection. Some eggs are chosen to be queens, and we don't know why. And we know that bees can determine certain DNA aspects of the, the eggs of, um, before, uh, and they choose an appropriate egg to become a queen. In the right scenarios, if they're desperate, they can, ch they can, ch they can just choose anything. This is an example of what happens with... Um, the brood. So this is what the queen does. 
The queen basically puts that abdomen down to a hexagonal cell. And you'll see on the bottom left these rods, these white rods. So that's what a beekeeper is looking for when they inspect a hive. When you see eggs, because you don't always see a queen when you inspect a hive, but you should be able to see eggs. And this tells you everything's well. The queen is alive. She's been laying at least. She's been laying. Then these eggs hatch after three days to produce larvae. And these larvae get fed on royal jelly, which um, brood jelly, which is the creamy material behind it. Um, this is, um, it remains in that fashion for five days. And then on the eighth day, which is number, number three, they actually cap over the cell with, what, with um, pollen and wax. And that's what you can see in this picture in the middle. It looks like a biscuit colored material. So this is basically um, that they seal in the, the larvae and it goes through metamorphosis, just like a caterpillar does. And then it comes out as a fully fledged bee. But if you take them out beforehand, they look like this the kind of white pupas. Um, and in this state, they're unable to move. They're kind of paralyzed. And so they're very vulnerable at that stage. Um, so let's talk a wee bit about the nest of the honeybee. This is what a natural nest would look like um, inside of a, you have to imagine this inside of a cavity of a tree or in the Middle, the Middle East and the Mediterranean, you normally get bees in caves. So you've got two distinct parts really of a natural nest. You've got the center, which is kept warm by the bees and this is where the brood is, and this is where the pollen is. The pollen is kept there so that it can be used to feed the larvae. And then on the outer honey, on the outer um, wax comb, you'll tend to get the excess honey that's being produced, stored there. And the reason they do that is that this excess, because honey as a material is a good insulator, and so it helps keep them warm. So if you, so this is us looking longitudinal, along side on. If we look face on to one of the middle combs, ah, it's too much auto action here, Alex. <laughs> it's fine. Um, Microsoft. So this is what it would look like. You've got the brood in the middle, the pollen outside, and then in the corners is honey. This pollen and honey is used for feeding the larvae. So the, the pollen's in the cells as well? Yes, as, as, they're as cells as of as pollen, well. yeah. So how does this communicate into the beehive that modern beekeepers use? So this is a breakdown of, there are many variations on beehives, but this is basically the common setup. We've got uh, an, a bottom, uh, an entrance, We've got what's called a brood box or a hive body, which is basically the largest box there. There's a material called a queen excluder, which is usually a piece of plastic or a piece of metal with holes in it. There is a smaller box on top called a super, from Latin meaning above. Um, an inner cover or a crown board, as it's mainly called. And that's used just to separate the roof from the, the bees below. And then the roof is really important, particularly in Scotland. This is what keeps all the rain out. And this is what also, in, in, in here in Scotland, we tend to have very heavy roofs. So when it's weather like today, um, they don't fall over. Um, how does this work? Think of the, what a beekeeper does is they put the queen and the bees in the big box at the bottom. And then you put, the, you put it together. This queen excluder is what allows honey to be removed from a beehive without disturbing the bees. So this queen excluder has holes big enough for workers to get through, but the holes are too small for a queen to fit through. So when the workers go into the super box to produce wax, the queen can't go in and lay eggs. And so the only thing they can put in there is pollen and honey. And so that allows the honey, excess honey, to be uh, removed 
easily from a hive without disturbing the nest. Now, in the past, skepists, which is um, using wheat or straw to produce these um, kind of medieval um, hives, they would routinely kill the bees and take the honey. So when this, did, when this came out, the wooden frame hive, it was a massive innovation to, um, um, for the well-being of bees. Um, does anyone want to guess why the super box is so much smaller in size than the brood chamber box? Any guesses? Because that's just the ratio of extra honey they can produce. No. It's to do with to do with weight. The super of honey will weigh about 12 kilos. Honey is really heavy. Whereas if a bigger box is used, like the hive body in that position, it can weigh about 20 to 25 kilos, which is a lot. And so Generally, honey is, um, is these boxes above the nest are smaller for that reason. And as people get older, back problems and beekeeping is quite a common issue. So it's for the convenience of the beekeeper. That's right. Not for the uh, not for the bees. Okay. <laughs> but then it's inconvenient for the bees if the two, beekeeper. Can you have two supers? On yeah, normally, box? normally when you buy a beehive, it comes with two supers. And uh, it depends on how prof how um, on the. Each colony has a different personality and a different ability to produce honey. And so you'll see lots of different um, size bee, um, sized hives depend, depending on the personality of the colony. Now, we're kind of talking now about Scotland, our climate and how it affects bees. You've all probably seen an Attenborough documentary at some point in your life about penguins in Antarctica where they sit, they kind of huddle in a disc, right? Well, bees do the same, but in a sphere. They huddle in a sphere. Now, what they, they can withstand temperatures down to minus 30, which they routinely do in Canada, no problem. Uh, the problem in Scotland is, unlike Canada, it's not a dry cold. We've got damp along with the cold. And the bees do not like the damp. The fungus is a big issue for them. Um, but... What the bees tend to do is between the end of November and probably the end of, and really all of the beginning of May, is they're in what's called a cluster, which is a sphere of bees. They consume honey, they dislocate their wings, which is something they can do, and they can actually buzz or vibrate their wing muscles. And it can produce a temperature per bee of about 45 centigrade. And that's how they keep themselves warm. And they will do that. The ones on the edge will get cold and then they'll go in to warm up and they just keep doing that. And the queen is in the middle. Um, so that's how the bees survive winter. Then we in Scotland tend to have a very, we have a, a very short spring. So this year it was, and this is one of the unusual things about Scotland is that um, compared with the south of England or Europe, We'll have flowers available in March, like dandelions, which are really important. Um, things like gorse, there you go. Thank you for the hint. Gorse. <laughs> gorse. But it's just too damn cold. The bees can't go out of the cluster and they need about 15 degrees centigrade to comfortably fly. But some varieties are able to fly in colder weather. They're more adapted to the miserable climate of Scotland. Um, Sorry, uh, is that all about the um, air temperature then? Because I, I, I used to live with bees. They were in the wall of my flat, and they used to, they used to burrow through the wall. It was creepy. But anyway, if, if, if they're in a flat, obviously their hive is going to feel the elements less. Yeah, you're paying but, for them to stay warm. Uh, <laughs> but are they like, how do they know what the temperature is outside? Are they, they can feel it. To test it. Their or? antennae have temperature sensors. Mm. Their antennae are extremely sensitive. Uh, they have chemical sensors, gravitational sensors. They have thermal, humidity. They, they have a huge array mm. of sensors on their antenna to determine a huge number of things. When, um, when the population increases, how does nature choose which ones live and which ones die? 
In what and, sense? Well, if, if, if it's going down by 75%, yes. how, how do those... Do those 75% die outside the hive or inside the hive? Yeah, so they, they work themselves to death, and is how it works. But do they die in the hive? No, no, that's one of the remarkable things about bees, is they try not to die in the hive. Uh, they do have, un there, is an there are bees that do undertaker duties, chuck out dead things, dead bees, but primarily they work themselves to death, they die out in the, in the, in the outside the hive, and that's deliberate. Because if they have a disease, they don't want it to spread in the hive. Um, and it's all, they're very clean animals. And actually, apart from a laboratory, the most clean place on earth is in a beehive. Mm. Um, so we have a very short spring, and it's really just April. Um, so we can have flowers available for the bees to get to, which happened this year, the half, middle of April, the rapeseed flowers were out. There was all these flowers, but the bees didn't come out till about the first week of May. It was just so cold. Um, and that's because we're a maritime climate. We're not like continental US or, or continental Europe. Our sea temperature is at its coldest in spring, in March and April, which makes the land cold. That also means that we get a really long Indian summer. So our summer goes really, in real terms, it's still summer. And... Mm -hmm. and um, maybe December when it gets darker is really when it starts to get below 10 centigrade. Um, so we have a, a flow in the spring of May flowers. June, June is a wild card. It's either okay, terrible, or somewhere in between. And the reason for that is there's an adaptation in plants where you get flowers in spring and flowers in summer, but there's a gap between them. That gap, there's not many flowers in Scotland that close the gap. One of them is white clover, which has disappeared almost because a lot of people don't like it on their lawn, so they cut it or they put weed killer on it. And that is one of the most important things you can do at home to keep bees and other pollinators alive is there's very few flowers out there. Unless you're talking about non-natives like lavender and other plants and thyme and lots of these flowers which, which will bloom in June. But off the weeds, the natural things, most of them die out at the first week of May, uh, first week of June, excuse me. And then the proper, like the rosemary, willow herb and all the other summer flowers don't come out until the first or second week of June, of July. So you can have one month of just not much food. Um, so here's some of the examples of some of the important bee plants. Some are just producing pollen, and some are producing nectar and pollen. Um, goat willow is a really important tree. The amount of pollen this thing produces is incredible. And in my opinion, it defines the start of the beekeeping year. If you come to, um, to if you go and you see one of these trees in mid-April, the number of bees on it in queen bumblebees is unbelievable. This is the pollen which produces the first cohort of bees of the year then the hawthorn this year was a mat was a really good uh, and the honey from the hawthorn really flowed in summer we get a lot the rosemary willow herb is is also a very important bee plant and now the ivy has just come out about 10 percent of it is in flower um probably by the start of next month half of it will be in flower and that's the last source of food before winter both of um of honey and pollen, sorry, nectar and pollen. Just one thing that I would like you to remember from this talk is the importance not only of the plants, but about when they actually bloom. And I mentioned the June gap. So one of the important things, if you have uh, an orchard or if you have an allotment, if you produce foods in, an, in a garden, is you want to have the flower cascade so this is a domino of flowers that are continuously open from the beginning of spring to the end of autumn. Mm. This is really important because if there's a gap, which you get a lot of in the countryside, because there's just cereal crops when the oil seed rate finishes. So if it's apart from the, the shrubs and the trees that partition farmland, there's not actually much there for, for pollinators because wheat and barley doesn't really do anything for all these, um, all these critters. So ensuring that if you look at your garden, 
make sure there's always something in flower at every time of the year. And that's a simple thing that actually a lot of gardeners do that are into beauty, never mind helping the environment. I've got a question. I've been fascinated with ivy because it really, uh, it, it, I've seen so many insects on it. Yeah. But I've noticed that some ivies are really good and some ivies are don't seem and I'm wondering whether it's it's just the the the, the chronological time I'm standing in front of it, or are there different phenotypes? Are there some some types of ivy or or that are better than others? I was looking at also fuchsia. Uh, yeah. So in Scotland, ivy is the the last bee plant in autumn, but also there's late blooming in August. Fuchsia is the other one that's late blooming. And in the highlands of Scotland, that's the only thing that bees have to eat is the invasive fuchsias, which were brought in from South America, um, believe it or not. There are different types of ivy. I don't know why, so I've noticed that not all the ivy flowers open each year. And I think it's because it's just too cold. If we get a really hot October and September, I think it will all open. Is but, there such a thing as ivy honey? Yes, and I've produced it once, many, many years ago. Um, it's a wonderfully, it tastes very medicinal, and it is a medicinal honey. Um, they produce a lot of it in, in Ireland because you need a muggy, warm winter, which the Irish get because they're on the Atlantic. And so they get a lot of ivy honey, and they've done a lot of work on it. They found that ivy honey will release phlegm in a chest infection. Mm. It's really good for chest infections, um, apparently. So, talk, so that leads on to honey. Thank you, Alex. So we're going to just talk a bit about what is honey from a material chemical point of view, and then we'll go on to the legal definition. How are we doing? Have we got any questions so far? No. <coughs> I think we're all just shoving them out when they come along. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So a lot of people, now there's a huge complexity to honey, but if we boil it down chemically, what is it? It's actually very simple. Honey is a super saturated solution of sugars. That's all it is to a first approximation. Now what that means is if you remember back to your high school chemistry class, where you mixed in copper sulfate with water and you put in all this powder until it couldn't take no more uh, and then you shove a wee bit of string in it and then you let the water evaporate over a week and you'll get the crystals growing on the... What happens is the water evaporates. It can't hold all of that copper sulfate anymore. So it attaches it to whatever uh, surface is available and the, str the, the string has got a roughness to it which attracts the crystals onto it. The glass is so flat that you don't get as much attraction and so you grow a beautiful wee crystal of copper, copper sulfate or it could actually just be sugar. Um, now that's what honey is generally 18% water and um, let's think 82% I've got that right or 78% uh, sugar. So it's, um, it's got a lot of sugar in there. And it's so much sugar, it cannot physically dissolve it all. Mm. And so it's all, it's all lying in this solution. And over time, the sugar crystals turn and rotate to be in line with hydrogen bonding and they form a crystal structure. Mm. The natural state of honey is a solid crystalline material. So when you see honey that is hard, it's crystalline, that's what honey should be like. It's only liquid when it's taken off the hive. Because as I mentioned, the hive's about 35 centigrade in temperature. Mm. And so it's going to be liquid in that form. But once you've got it into a cool, dark place in your pantry, it's going to slowly crystallize. Um, so nothing wrong with crystallization. It's supposed to crystallize. So is the only thing stopping it from crystallizing in a jar, the fact that there's no nucleation site or no, however you described it? Is, is that yes, the only thing that's... that's one factor. So depending also on the source of nectars in it will either increase the rate 
of uh, crystallization mm. or decrease it. Um, and also the, the container as well is important. So mm. in, a, in a spherical or a cylindrical um, jar, it will take longer to right. crystallize than hexagonal jars, I would think. I haven't, I haven't noticed that. hexagonal, then. Because <laughs> hexagons are... I love them. Fantastic. <laughs> but it doesn't make much difference. Um, the... the um, and some varieties of honey are actually served crystalline because mm. they rapidly crystallize after two days, so it's impossible to, to actually sell it in liquid form, of which this is one, is rapeseed. Rapeseed, two days, and it goes quite concrete. Or what you do is you do the creaming process, which is what's undergone with this honey, to make it buttery and soft set. And I'll talk about that later. But anyway, honey contains a whole number of other things, right? It's got water, obviously. That's the component of honey. It's got sugars, principally glucose, fructose, and sucrose. But there are up 10 to 20 other sugars that can occur in honey, uh, such as maltose and others. There are proteins. Now, most blossom honeys have about 0.1% protein content, but actually some varieties have a lot, like heather honey. Scottish heather honey has 3% water, uh, protein content. That's a lot. And that's why heather honey is not, is, um, is a gel, is an unusual chemical property of being a gel. Um, it has proteins and amino acids, so heather honey in particular, uh, vitamins, there's many minerals. The darker the color of a honey, you, it normally represents the quantity of minerals. So usually um, honeydew honeys, which um, come from insects and come from trees and other shrubs indirectly by insects, have a higher mineral content and are also considered medicinal. Um, there's a lot of organic acids and Honey has a low pH, it's an acidic food. It's usually between three and a half to four and a half on the pH scale. Uh, it contains pollen, and the pollen can, is usually a indi good indicator of the, the flowers that the bee has gone on, in that um, uh, it, the pollen normally indicates the nectars that are in the honey, but it doesn't always indicate it. So, it's, so that's one thing to remember. It's got a lot of enzymes that come from the bees themselves, of which two are really important. Invertase, which takes the sucrose. Sucrose is a fructose molecule and a glucose sugar molecule, which is connected together. And invertase cuts that in half. And that's one of the things bees do to, um, to nectar. The second thing that comes from the bees is the enzyme glucose oxidase. Now, what that does is it takes the glucose sugar and it will transform it into gluconic acid and hydrogen peroxide. And this is in all honey varieties. And this is the main mechanism by which honey is antibacterial and antimicrobial because the hydrogen peroxide is what's killing all of the microbes. There are some varieties of honey that are more medicinal because they have extracts of plants in them, but actually all honey is antibacterial. Um, then you've got tannins, bioflavonoids, and alkaloids, which, um, which are good for immu your immune system. Um, and then finally, there's a, there's a chemical called 5-hydromethylfurfural, or HMF, as it's commonly called. And this is basically how we, as beekeepers, keep track of the, how old a honey is or how, um, or how much a honey has been warmed. There's a criteria in the law that the measurement of this chemical cannot be above 40 milligrams per kilo. Um, and that can happen if the honey's been overheated or if the honey's really, really old. Um, there's other properties that I've already mentioned. It's a honey is a natural sweet substance. It's acidic. It's, it can be a liquid, a gel, or a solid. It's antimicrobial. It has organoleptic properties, which is a fancy name for we can experience honey through our senses, through our taste, through our um, touch in the tongue, but also through our nose, through our olfactory bulb, the aromas. Honey is also antifungal. It's a, a poor conductor of heat, which is saying it's a good insulator. 
It's anti-inflammatory and it's used a lot on, on burns in particular. Um, now it's used extensively in veterinary medicine on cuts and scratches, not so much in human medicine. Um, um, there used to, it used to be used a lot in um, Roman and Greek medicine uh, and also in Vedic medicine it's used, honey especially for problems with the eyes. Um, it's used a lot for acne and spots and things. It's, um, but there's been a move, I think, with modern medicine is they, they will only give, say, on the National Health Service, honey that has been sterilized, that's gone probably through gamma ray radiation to kill any bacteria that might be in, inside honey. Um, there are yeasts in honey and they do not, they're not active unless the water content of the honey goes up and it becomes really um, uh, watery. And that comes to another property, which is called hygroscopic. That means that if you leave honey open, in the jar, leave the jar open, it will suck all the water from the atmosphere in. And eventually after a month, it will go up maybe 2% water in cotton. And eventually it gets to a point where all those yeasts are able to start producing alcohol mm. and the honey will ferment into meat. Uh, at that point, it's unfit for sale. Um, and you can, you can only use it as an ingredient in food or you can process it further to make meat. Um, it has relatively high density. And there's, it comes in a whole range of colors. And the colors can either be from the, it's the same compound that produces the chlorophyll in the leaves that is transfused into the honey in the nectar. So, Finally, we get to the really exciting bit, which is our legal instrument that defines honey. This is the Honey Regulation Scotland 2015. Um, so I'll just read this out because I think this is really important. Uh, honey means the natural sweet substance produced by Apis mellifera bees from the nectar of plants or from secretions of living parts of plants or excretions of plants sucking insects on the living parts of plants, within which the bees collect, transform by combining with specific substances of their own, deposit, dehydrate, store, leave in honeycombs to ripen and mature. So they're not just right, made by bees. <laughs> Thank you. So in summary, honey is made by honeybees, right? At no point in this spiel does it say a human can come along. And this is part of the definition of honey, is a beekeeper, all a beekeeper does is takes honey, honeycomb, cuts it, puts it into a container, takes honeycomb, takes the honey out of the honeycomb called extracted honey and puts it in a jar. That's all a beekeeper is allowed legally to do. If anything else happens to that honey, it is no longer called honey. It's now something else. Honey is a primary food product. It's a pure food product. I'll just give a, a small explanation about the picture on the left. So this is what honey looks like when it's, when it's um, produced from a, a beehive. Uh, the honeycomb, so bees take the nectar, which is 80% water, and they bring it down to 20% water or less. They do that by sucking the nectar in and out of their proboscis tongue, and they evaporate off water. They do that by manually. Then what they do, at a certain point, that process is no longer effective. They will actually put the, the ripened nectar into these frames high above the nest, and the bees will waft a draft deliberately over them to evaporate the extra water. And when it's below 18% water, just they will cap it with beeswax. So what you're looking at there, that white stuff is all pure white beeswax. And that's, that's to stop the water from the air coming back and creating um, moisture uh, in, the, in the honey. And they'll uncap it once they want to eat it. All right, so there are different types of honey defined in the regulation. Um, and this is the same regulation, by the way, in England, and it's a copy of the one that's in the European Union law. 
and that you know, that's also linked to a more international standard. So it's it's pretty it's pretty common, pretty rigorous. So blossom honey can come from two things. It can come from the nectaries of a flower, which you see with the bee and the lavender. But also what a lot of people don't know is there are a lot of nectaries that don't involve flowers. Some plants have nectaries which do not involve flowers. So here is a picture of a bee on cherry laurel, which is the commonly used hedging at uh, new estates when they build them. Um, cherry laurel produces flowers, but it also produces nectar from these little extra floral nectaries. And it's believed that plants do this as an adaptation against aphids. They give a, they give a wee bit of, um, of nectar to bring the ants up and the ants come and eat the aphids mm. and stop the, the plant being predated on. But the bees are not daft. They'll see the sugar, they'll go for it and they'll collect it. The same with uh, field beans and, and uh, broad beans. You'll get a lot of um, soup, you'll get a lot of um, quite a significant portion of the honey that comes off beans is not from the flower, but from the extra floral nectary. The second type of honey is honeydew, which is very rare. And I think I'm one of the only people in Scotland that actually produces it. Um, we get a wee bit in this area of Edinburgh uh, and it's produced by aphids. So the aphids are creatures that suck the sugar uh, systems of plants, of trees, um, and they also take out a lot of minerals at the same time. They then squirt this out onto the leaves of trees and bees come along and collect that. And when you go in a sunny day, if you go out and you look at some plant or some trees, you'll notice, and I always see it on sycamores, you always see lots of a shiny leaf, kind of a sugary look. That's, that's the honeydew from the aphids. Um, the bees collect that and they can, like nectar, they then ripen that and they produce a honey from it. It's more common in Europe um, honeydew in Europe is mainly produced by the Metcalfa cricket and in Italy the Malata it's called, it's the common honeydew and this comes from this cricket. Uh, honeydew is normally dark in character, it's black to dark red. How do you control them? You can't. So you just put them close to a source? So I'll talk a bit about that later if you don't mind Stephen. It's, um, it's, uh, in Europe it's easier to, um, to control things because it's a bigger continent. Um, and also there's the agricultural industry is larger. So for example, in, um, in Poland, they'll have gigantic fields say of um, a certain crop. You put your bees there, you're almost certain that the majority of the nectar has derived from that crop. And in Greece, I have uh, colleagues who go to the fir forests for the bees, and they get the fir honeydew honey. There's nothing there but fir trees. We don't really have that. In, mm. We have pockets of forests. And we, it, there's not a big enough, um, it's hard to control. And it's, that is a problem, but it's also an advantage, which I'll explain. There's comb honey, is another way to sell honey. Um, a full frame like that can be between one and three kilos in weight. Um, you, normally it's sold in um, half pound containers, which uh, I have the yellow clover in half pound containers. So this um, is the common way, way it's honeycomb is sold today. But also in the past, in particular in 1950s and 1960s, there was a tradition of using one pound square sections and also what are called Ross rounds, which are basically the same one pound in weight honeycomb. Um, now, I have to also um, give you an account of the problems that we're having as a, as a global, in the global beekeeping community. Um, we, um, honey, there's such a thing called honey, um, food crime, which is when people are selling food that is uh, mislabeled for example, um, of the food crimes and of adulterated foods, the first number one adulterated product in the world is milk. Second is olive oil and third is honey. 
Now, we had uh, the Scottish Beekeepers Association um, had uh, Professor Norberto Garcia from Buenos Aires University do a study for us because he is the chair of economics or in the, the economics working group of the, the beekeeping council called Atamondia. And his subject is honey fraud. And if you have Netflix, the first episode of the series Rotten, which is about food crime, first episode is got him um, as, the, as the main person that's interviewed on problems with honey. So what he found from, I believe, our United Nations data is that a majority of the UK honey is most likely fraudulent um, and that we're in fact the worst country in Europe for honey fraud, um, which is a terrible thing to say. Um, he cannot say that it's, he, from the information, he can see where, which countries be, be, um, honey is being imported from and the, how, how much, um, uh, what grade of honey it is. And that doesn't mean it's fraud or adulterated, but the, basically you bet, get what you pay for. If you buy in a lot of cheap honey from the Far East, it's unlikely to be high quality or even real. We just know that instinctively. Um, and so how does it happen? Um, you can have, basically, there is no honey in it. It's just sugar syrups, fructose and glucose syrups that are produced in a lab with maybe some flavorings. Um, it can be real honey, which is diluted down with sugar syrups. It can be real honey uh, mixed in with a cheaper real honey from another country, but that second country is not declared on the label. Um, so there were cases this, um, that, uh, in the UK of um, individuals in England importing in honey from other countries, relabeling re it as English and selling it on. That's a form of fraud. That's not telling the consumer the truth about what they're buying. Um, and there's also now um, a, a huge emphasis on this um, oxymoron term, vegan honey. Uh, Apamondia, the World Council, has just given a very stern statement reiterating all the, the definition of honey from the honey regulations as well as the uh, other world um, definitions of honey to, to show that vegan honey doesn't make sense and also it is not it cannot be called whatever it is cannot be called vegan honey because honey is very strictly defined and that's not part of the the um, honey regulations what, what is that oh, sorry vegan what is vegan um, vegan to the best of my knowledge it's basically um, artificially it's laboratory produced honey it's a fabricated version of honey made from um, compounds that may exist in plants. Okay, so no bees? No, nothing to do with bees. Right. So it's not honey? It's not honey. No. <laughs> but, some, but some producers may call it vegan honey, which, is, which uh, the World Council have um, stated is uh, not allowed by, by the laws of most countries. No. Um, and also may in fact be uh, misleading because of the definition of honey. We have a similar problem in Britain with honey infusions, not allowed, really. It's not part of the honey regulations because it's like saying uh, an oxygen infusion. Oxygen is a pure element that cannot be infused. The same with honey. Honey is a pure food item. So it's a, also, I cannot, it's a bit difficult to, um, to, to, to pitch. You have to create a new word. You can call it... Um, uh, a, cock uh, a cocktail or a mixture, you can call it sub so long as the word honey is not used in the name, but it's included in the ingredients list, it's fine. So one of the issues that appeared this year at some of the festivals is the, the reference to chili honey. Now, chili honey means honey produced by bees feeding on the flowers of chili plants, right? But that's not what people mean by chili honey. What they mean is they're buying some honey from somewhere and they're mixing it with chili powder. That is an infusion, and that that's another. So these this sloppiness is a bit of an issue in the market. Um, and honey is quite well protected legally. It's just that we need more support to ensure that the the right language is on the label. Um, 
So some of the funner parts of honey, right? So I mentioned these organoleptic properties. So we're aware of our senses. So how do we experience honey? Well, I suppose we also look at honey. We experience it through our eyes. We experience honey as we do most food items through our gustatory palate. So tastes, these are the sensations that we get through the tongue. These are bitterness, sourness, sweetness, saltiness, and umami. Now, these are, the, 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 these are all on the tongue. You then have aromas and odors. Odors are through the nose, smelling a honey and getting a, a, a waft of the chemicals that are in honey. And aromas are generally those which come via interaction with the saliva in your mouth and or chemical reactions with saliva in your mouth. So that's when you smell something, it, it seems to, the, the experience is usually similar to how it tastes. Now I'm using that word wrongly, that you taste with your tongue, but the aromas and the odors are actually detected at the olfactory bulb behind the nose. So that's why when you get a cold, you only say you lose your sense of taste, but you don't. You lose your sense of aromas and odors, but you retain an ability to detect salt and to detect sugar and all of the taste sensations. And this is the sort of, these are the senses that are used to characterize a honey for the delight of eating and food. So, but before that, I'll talk just, I'll just reiterate some of the physical states that honey goes through. I mentioned that when it's liquid, honey is, um, so when honey is liquid, it's normally because it's just been extracted or it's been warmed gently, 35 degrees, no more, to mimic the high temperature. Um, and at this temperature, it doesn't denature enzymes, it doesn't destroy the properties of honey. If you go over 40 degrees, just like any biological material, it starts to degrade, destroys the goodness of it. Um, now, liquid, in liquid form, the chemicals have a very large surface area, which means that the flavor of the honey will be at its most intense when the material is in liquid form. Now, eventually it will crystallize. It can take two days or two years to crystallize. Um, and the picture I've got there shows an interesting, what we call frosting. You see this white mm. streak. This is not a defect of honey. This is actually caused by the contraction of honey when it is crystallizing and it creates, it actually pulls away from the glass. And in that, gla in that interstitial space, a partial vacuum is formed and the sugars rather than crystallize will go in and they will, they'll form a disordered solid state, which is an amorphous, amorphous state. And that's what basically produces surf on water and it also produces this white streakiness. There's nothing defective about this honey. It's just basically the beekeeper didn't wait long enough for it to contract before putting it in the jar. And that's, but you'll see this a lot with, with crystallized honey. And this is not something to be concerned about. Um, the second type of solid honey you'll find is soft set. This is very common with honeys that rapidly granulate. So oil seed rape is one. Ivy is another, and people like to experiment. Some, some, some customers prefer honey to have a solid pastiness. It's easier to manipulate with a knife onto hot toast, for example, mm. uh, rather than liquid. And then there's gels. So honey, heather honey is a gel, and that's, I alluded to before, because of its high protein content. It's neither liquid nor solid. Um, so we talked a bit, it was really your question, Stephen, about how is it possible to, um, to, to, know, to kind of control where the bees are going. So there are a couple of crops in Scotland where you can be assured that the majority of the nectar has come from one source. So if the majority of that, so in that case, we call it monofloral, it's from one source. Uh, rapeseed, because there's so much of it outside of Edinburgh and up in the east coast of the UK. Mm. Um, when you put your bees there, the, the bees go nuts. They love rapeseed flowers. And um, prime, the vast majority of the nectar will derive from that flower. 
But the bees don't usually like just going to one flower, and only one flower only, because they don't get pollen diversity. So you will get other things. So other things which you get, usually things like wild cherry, maybe some hawthorn, uh, some sycamore, but those will be diluted down by the incredible concentration of rapeseed. Can you taste the difference? Yes. As a judge, can you yes. taste where that's come from? Like what the bees have been feeding on when you, when you taste a, a Yes, if it's, a, if it's a, a nectar that I'm aware of. Right. Yes. You can certainly tell rapeseed. Pardon? You can certainly tell rapeseed. Yes. Yeah. Rapeseed is uh, very yeah. distinctive. Very distinctive. Um, heather is another. So that's the Scotland's autumn crop. And it's also monofloral because it, both rape and heather are migratory uh, crops. The beekeeper will bring bees usually from town into the countryside for the rapeseed. And then in autumn, in August, when the heather, ling heather is out, they'll bring the bees to the hills or the moorland. And the only thing really out there is the heather. Um, but there is also other things like meadowsweet, and you can never really get away from um, bramble and rosemary willow herb, which is pretty ubiquitous in nettles. So they might produce, they might get some nectar from that, but it, it won't be, a, it'll be a minority of the content of the, the honey. And then in, in town, uh, most cities in Britain have a lot of lime trees, which is a phenomenally good thing for beekeepers and bees. Um, and lime, I mean, I get a lot of lime uh, and that is, I would say, monofloral. And I say that because there is an overwhelming, dis overwhelming taste that comes from the lime um, and it is very distinctive and it's repeatable each year. And that's one thing about monoflorals. There is always variation in flavour due to soil, the terroir, due to the weather. But um, normally the, the flavour descriptors are the same for that particular source. Mm. Now, the other thing is you get multifloral honeys, which is the spring honey is an example of that. Um, so this was a really good spring. I don't know if you noticed, it was really hot in June um, and, and the end of May. And so the bees principally were on the hawthorn, sycamore trees, and sweet chestnut if it's around. And this honey is a mix of that, plus all the other spring flowers like forget-me-nots, um, and maybe a bit of willow, and a little bit of a horse chestnut. Um, so the good thing about a uh, multifloral is you get a greater depth in flavour. You get a longer flavour profile if you're lucky. You can get a higher a better taste experience usually from a multifloral because you have lots of different notes in there um, that you might not get from a single source of, uh, of, of nectar. But also that means that because it's, an, it's a taste of the landscape and it's a natural blend given by the bees, that's going to change every year, right? So for example, this summer, um, because it rains so badly uh, in July and August, I noticed a lot of thistles. So I think this year the honey will be representative of a lot of thistles that we didn't have last year. Mm. Um, so spring multifloral. So spring multifloral has distinct taste of hawthorn, which is right at the beginning. Uh, then the smokiness of the, the sycamore, uh, salty and bitterness, and also a woodiness. The sweet chest that comes right at the end and if you haven't tasted Italian sweet chestnut honey, you need to get a jar of it. Um, it uh, tastes like burnt sweet chest. Imagine chestnuts, but slightly burnt and then filled with loads of sugar. That's basically what sweet chestnut honey mm -hmm. tastes like. Um, and it's, this, is a, this is a very masculine honey. It's really, really nice. It's like bourbon, uh, woody and smoky. And it's not sweet at all. Um, and this thing, and we got a lot of awards for this. We got two stars of the Great Taste Awards, which means top 10% of honeys in the awards. Um, this is an exact, this is another two star we got. Um, this is um, the summer blossom, same apiaries, just different time of year. I would mention lime is, uh, lime is opposite. It's very feminine. It's really citrusy. It has a, a very iconic mentholic um, odor and taste, or it can present as minty. Uh, it's also very bright. 
And also the colour of the honey gives it away because you might not be able to see it, but when you examine lime honey, there should be a slight tinge of green to the colour uh, and also when it's solidified. Rapeseed is generally a pure white or slightly grey off-white colour. It's a really, really confectionery sweet honey. It tastes as if you've just consumed um, uh, icing sugar. Um, it's refreshing and this comes from the, the fact that the crystals in it are being creamed to be very small. So when you put it on your tongue, the first thing that happens is these crystals start dissolving and they suck the heat out of your tongue. It gives a cooling, refreshing feeling, which is really nice. Um, and because it's been creamed, it has this buttery texture. And so you've got that in the sweetness. And because there's always something else in the environment. So, for example, in West Lothian, there's, uh, there's a lot of um, meadow flowers. So there's a fruitiness that comes from that, that extends beyond the normal sweetness of rapeseed. Uh, and then you also have a vegetal element in rapeseed, which is normally a slight smell of cabbage. Uh, and I would say that we have in Scotland probably some of the best rapeseeds in the world. If you taste some of the stuff from mainland Europe, it can be quite overpowering, um, whereas this is very delicate. Uh, yellow clover, this is a special, this is a cover crop and also has been talked about and written about by Aristotle, one of the first uh, bee plants to be mentioned in literature uh, for the bees he kept many thousands of years ago. Um, and it's, uh, it's really well defined in terms of its sweetness. All the clovers have this ticklish floral intensity. They're sweet, but in particular, cinnamon, um, yellow clover has a strong aroma of cinnamon, which makes it particularly nice. Um, this is a, I would call it more of a meadow, flower, meadow honey. So this is in West Lothian. Um, the bees are actually up on the bins outside of um, the, um, from Ingleston onwards to uh, Win Broxburn and Winchester. There's uh, Win Win Winchborough. There's these bins of shale and it's full of wildflowers, clovers and willow herbs and such. This honey is really silky. It's very viscous. It has a very delicate floral element. It has the clover taste, but it's very, it's much diluted, probably because there's a lot of rosebee willow herb. Rosebee willow herb is almost transparent as a honey. And I see most people in Scotland call rosebee willow herb Ireland. I thought that was the Americans. No, it's not. All right, we call it rosebee willow herb in the beekeeping community. Um, so, or, or just willow herb. Um, and this, yeah, and so it has a very delicate floral um, element and it's sweet but I think what makes this one special is the silky dry it's a very dry honey 16% water very low that's like it's almost like North African honey you don't get that that's because that year was a phenomenally hot year um, now this everyone knows about Heather do I need to talk about it? <laughs> oh, <please laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, it's just finished in fact still to bring the bees back from the Heather um Heather is really sweet, it's, but it's usually not observable because it's got, an, it's got a floral element and it's got this really strong kind of caramel woody um, aroma, which is what's characteristic about a good heather honey. And it, it depends on the terroir because Scottish heather honey changes depending on the, the hill that you get it from. So some uh, varieties are creamy uh, and caramelly, uh, and they don't have a very strong bitterness. Some, for example, up near Dundee, really bitter. Uh, probably means it's really good for your health, though, because bitter compounds usually mean lots of bioflavonoids and alkaloids and all the good stuff that I'm sure Alex can tell us about another time. <laughs> <laughs> no, but bitterness in a honey usually is a good thing. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so Heather is... In, it's, it's one of the most antibacterial honeys. There was a study done to, and it showed that heather honey is more antibacterial than New Zealand manuka honey. But they just don't know how it works because they, they, it seems like there's more than one chemical mechanism that honey uses to kill microbes. But heather honey is really profound. And it's, in herbal medicine, they sometimes mention 
that it's good for anemia and problems like that. But I don't have a qualification to to tell you if that's it's really true. But I've read it somewhere. Um, then there's uh, honeydew. This is the rarest honey in Scotland. I think I mentioned that already. Um, it's a it's um, it's a very imagine it's the sticky toffee pudding of the honey world. Oh. It's really treacly. It's got a lovely citrusy backdrop from lime. Um, and it's got all some. Uh, it's got a slight piney wood note in it as well. Uh, it's really great with ice cream. It's great with tarts, and it's great with any sort of uh, any cake. Um, mm. It's really a wonderful honey. Um, so, if you like the idea of honey and perhaps tasting honey, I'm I'm, I'm actually conducting. Uh, honey tasting experience at St. James Centre on the 19th of October. It's um, at the Bonnian Wild uh, restaurant, which is uh, it's really a complex of restaurants which are run by Scottish chefs or people inspired by Scottish food. Um, so come along. Uh, it's on Eventbrite and it will be on my website as well, which is simplyhoney.co. Uh, you can just ask me after. Um, I will be running another uh, beekeeping course soon. Um, so if you're interested in doing a three-day uh, beekeeping course, um, let me know, send me an email. Um, and uh, we can also visit uh, one of my apiaries. We might not be able to do any inspections together at this end of, um, end of the season. However, um, we can look into doing some inspections next year. And... I would like to kind of end on the note of please choose real honey, fake honey, and honey fraud. It kills bees and it puts beekeepers into poverty across the globe. If you have Instagram, uh, please follow me. Uh, it's at Simply Honey Co. Um, my website is simplyhoney.co. I live in Leith. I'm in the Edinburgh area. I'm an Edinburgh beekeeper. So if you ever want anything, you don't have to wait for a another talk or a farmer's market, which I do do Leith and Stockbridge farmer's markets, you can just contact me and I'll deliver. Uh, so support me and support my bees and uh, honey is available if you wish to purchase. Uh, and I just want to say I've talked for quite a long time. Uh, I'm quite good at that, by the way. Uh, <laughs> so I just want to say thank you so much for your attention. Uh, it's been delightful. And uh, please do ask all those questions that you have waited to ask until now. Thank you. Thank you. You've made me really, really hungry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so is there an easy way to spot my dodgy money? Um, just to show my cheap crap. Yes. Yes. Um, normally, I mean, it's not... Normally, best thing is is to buy from a local beekeeper. That's always the best thing. Um, ha, not being able to do that, nor the the honey has to say where it's from. On the reverse side of a normal jar of honey, it should tell you if it's a blend. Blends may contain honey uh, from uh, abroad which, uh, so normally it may say uh, a blend of EU and non-EU honeys is quite common on a lot of uh, jars of honey. That doesn't mean that it's adulterated, um, but it, it means that it has got portions of honey in it from the EU zone and also from outside the EU zone, and it's not stating which country. Can I ask, is it safe to take the honey from bees? I, my partner doesn't like me buying honey because he says it should be left for the bees. <laughs> what do you mean? He'll be left well, for the bees? Well, then, do the, do the bees have a, a surfeit of honey that you can take it from them and they survive perfectly well? Yes, so we, we always tell um, beekeepers that they should leave 20 kilos of honey on each hive and if they cannot they should um, they should provide that storage 
that, that um, they should provide honey or an equipment. So normally, so I generally leave honey for the bees and I take the excess. But what can normally happen is people take honey off or take all the honey off and they feed sugar syrup uh, mm. this time of year. So they get about 20 kilos or 40 pounds in weight and then they will overwinter on that. And there's not a problem with that um, because pure white soup sugar is sucrose and there's no, um, there's no ill health effects from that. But the bees are all dying. Do we know why that is? is it well, that's a very vague statement. They, um, yeah, there is a problem, but it's becoming, uh, I hope, less and less. So we have mites that invaded Britain um, really since 2000s, the Varroa mite. This is a huge stress on bees. It originates from the Asian honeybee, um, and it was brought into Europe uh, by, via European Russia. Um, and it spread all the way from European Russia all the way to France, and then from France up to, to, um, to Scotland eventually. There are pockets in the north of Scotland that doesn't have it. But the bees, bees are more resistant now to Varroa through behavioural changes than they were before. It's still a problem, Varroa, um, but that was the main reason the bees were dying, was Varroa. And wasn't a virus, because I thought viruses were... Yes, yeah, so that's the problem. It's like mosquitoes aren't actually a bad thing, right? The problem is the diseases that they transfer into you, the parasites that are in the mosquito. The problem. Same with Varroa. Varroa is a vector for disease in honeybees because they feed off the... Uh, the fatty tissues of the bee, and when they perforate the bee, they allow viruses, and bacteria to invade that otherwise would not get in, and that's the same with um, mosquitoes. Is there wasn't a specific virus; has it yet been identified? No, there's a whole class of viruses. There's many viruses that bees get. But what's remarkable about bees is they don't get ill as often as other creatures. And it's due to a lot of the adaptations they have, the propolis they use, the cleanliness of their lifestyle. And was there not some implication of pesticides and herbicides? I heard it suggested that complicated but not understood chemical influence that was causing a decline in bee number globally? Um, so, in general, any form of poison used, uh, herbicides, pesticides, generally does have some effect on, uh, on insects. They're very sensitive to chemicals. <laughs> so some of the chemicals that are used can, may not actually kill bees, but they kill the bacteria in their gut. And that then causes nutritional problems because just like in human health, the, um, not all of the nutrition comes directly from food. And not all of, not the, the human body itself is not usually, uh, what am I trying to say? <laughs> some of the bacteria in our gut is producing some of the nutrition that we need that then flows into our body. And if there's any chemical or an antibiotic is taken that kills that, your nutrition will be affected and then your immune system will become uh, compromised and you'll probably catch diseases that normally wouldn't affect you. So we think that a little bit of that might, is good, probably happening from chemical exposure. Generally speaking, the, the bee health is then increasing. It's, it's no longer the scenario of a massive decline in global bee population. See, a lot of the problems we've got is the United States has a disproportionate publication of its terrible state of affairs on the rest of the world. So the US has some of the worst practices in terms of um, handling of bees. Uh, the migration of about a million beehives each January to California for the uh, almond pollination, which is, uh, causes a huge amount of disease to spread, huge amounts of stress, 
Um, one of the good things about Scotland is two things. We've got a fairly short season, so they sleep a lot. And that means that they can rejuvenate. Second thing is that we have so... We're not an agricultural nation, really. Uh, and if we are, it's more cattle and livestock and less so in, in arable crops. And that's a great thing because places like Edinburgh, cities, um, uh, craigs and, and heads of rock, these are inconveniences for farmers. These are inconveniences for people who build houses. So that's why they're filled with weeds. And these oases in the landscape are the places where the bees are going. Because they're not interested in what you've just purchased from but your, you know that the plant America, shop. In America, they've reclassified some products as non-vegan. Includes almonds, includes almonds, and well, almonds. Almond there's too much bee involved in it. So well, almonds are almost bees. like ninety-five percent dependent on honeybees. Yeah. You know, it's not just; it's they're very dependent on specifically honeybees. Mm. Is there any problem in this country with the um, so-called killer bees? No, mm -hmm. no, uh, they only are in South America. Uh, between uh, Uruguay and um, Mexico. Well, they meant to be working their way north. No, they're not. At the moment, they aren't into the United States. Right. We don't have anything like that here, and um, I'd like to say we'll never will because that was caused by humans. That's not actually. Uh, uh, it's not a real thing in the sense of a, a natural. Uh, type of bee. It's been created uh, by the action of people bringing African bees all the way from uh, Tanzania and South Africa to Brazil. Um, so the story behind the Africanized bee is that Brazil noticed that it was one of the lower producers of honey. And as you know, Brazil produces like every agricultural product you can think of. It's a mega house of agricultural products. So they wanted to boost their honey economy, their honey production. So they thought, well, Africa's similar in, in climate. Why don't we go over there? They put the native Scutellata bee. Um, so they brought some samples over and they had them in laboratories. And they, had, uh, they were keeping them alive in these uh, basically pens. Um, and then the guy that ran the experiment went on holiday and his assistant went to feed the bees. And uh, he managed to somehow tear a hole in the side of the uh, enclosure and the two or three swarms of bees escaped, went into the rainforest. And what happens is when the European bee, which is now all over the Americas, was brought by the uh, colonists uh, over there, um, the European bee, when it mixes with the African bee, their baby is really aggressive. And that is the Africanized bee. It will follow you for a mile and it will, um, it will sting a lot. So they kill a lot of people. Uh, but it's no longer really a big issue because of, um, unless it's, an, it's um, because a lot of the beekeepers now, they have big protective suits in Brazil. Uh, and the long story short is they fix the problem and they're now big honey producers. It's all okay. But at the cost of, <laughs> but at the cost of a huge amount of terror. Um, one of the oddest stories I heard was from America, and it was a beekeeper whose bees had started to produce blue honey. Yeah. And the problem was that they'd all invaded the local antifreeze factory, because the antifreeze had the sugar in it. And yeah. They were sort of, because this was easily available and it was easier to get it than to get the flower and egg and they brought it back, all back. And he, and I think he'd experimented to see was this going to be toxic or not. It was highly, highly toxic. <laughs> yeah, yeah antifreeze. There's not many top in, in terms of toxicity, there is only one honey that I'm aware of which is toxic, which is rod rhododendron ponticuum from eastern Turkey. This is the mad honey that you might hear in the news. So when Alexander the Great's army invaded the area, they they closed up all the wells and they left uh jars of this honey around and the army all got ill um, maybe some even died so it's um, mad honey does exist um, we don't have any of this type of rhododendron in my 
uh, as far as I'm aware, in the UK. Um, but most honey varieties are fine. Uh, I don't, don't think I've heard of a toxic honey. But it usually, I'm sure the taste would be incredibly bitter or incredibly awful. So I mean, it would give yeah, you a I hint. think the colour would be blue. <laughs> the colour, yeah, yeah. Something wrong. You get a variety of colours. You can get purple. Kazoo honey from the States is purple. If, if we're thinking about, uh, so I do like to, to eat honey. And I like to think about how I can support bees. Mm -hmm. So planting, what, what, what would you advise to put in your garden? Right. Or, or how, how, can, how can we help honeybees? So what first thing you can do is just, if you've got a piece of the garden that you can just leave to go fallow, that's the best thing you can do. Let the weeds grow because nature knows what should be there. It will also end up creating a habitat whereby bumblebees, because they usually live underneath a hedge in the soil, you'll get stuff actually nesting there. Um, June, so two other things you can do is um, let your dandelions grow in your lawn, let the clovers grow in your lawn. Uh, lawns are basically a big waste of space that no one's getting any support out of, plus you have to cut it down all the time. What a silly idea, right? So the, the clover is important in June. June flowers, early spring flowers, and late autumn flowers. If you grow, if you grow fuchsias for this time of year, if you grow things like cataniaster, uh, bees love those plants, even though they've got the tiniest flowers you can imagine. They love thyme and, uh, and lavender. And that's a great thing to plant for June. Um, generally, they like blue flowers because they don't see in, in reds. They only see blue and they see green and they see ultraviolet. So you'll find that they're always on blue flowers. Um, early spring flowers are important, like crocus. Um, if you, because the more pollen available in spring, the more chance they've got of surviving and starting up. Oh, they love borage, love phacelia. Borage is a pub for bees because their nectar is constantly overfilled with nectar and recharge. Um, yeah, just um, a lot of wild, just allowing some weeds to grow and, uh, and having the dandelions and, uh, and letting the clover grow. All of that is just great for bees and not using chemicals. You can buy this really cool flamethrower for organic weeding. Hint, hint. Have fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not just bad for um, the, you know, obviously if it's having an ill effect on um, bees, we don't know what it might be doing to us. So, Just a question in terms of using honey. Um, as you were saying, like with the temperature above 40 degrees, would destroy yeah. like, you know, properties, enzymes yeah. and... Uh, if you're using it on your tea, would you let your tea cool down before you add some honey or? So I think when you put it in tea, it's more as a flavoring uh -huh. rather than what in the actual goodness of the honey. Okay. That's my, my view. Um, obviously, keep it, keep it below 40 degrees mm -hmm. if you wanted to have it for a medicinal use. Yeah. Um, I mean, I just tend to take a teaspoon raw. Um, uh, or have it, um, if, especially if it's a good honey, you want it, like this is a teaspoon, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but yeah, that's it. you're doing it for a different thing there when you put it in tea. You, you, you are probably killing some of the goodness. And in general, I'd say that like any pr seasonal product, honey also has a best before date, which is usually two years, three years mm -hmm. after it was produced. Um, and that's because all the goodness does start to decay away eventually. So although they did find honey that was safe to eat from um, ancient Egypt in the tombs of the, the pharaohs, doesn't mean that it's nutritious. Mm -hmm. Honey will always remain safe to eat if it's kept in a closed jar, but it doesn't mean it's nutritious eventually. It'll go black yeah. with all this HMF compound that is produced when sugars start to break down. Tell us about the honeys you brought. Yeah, so, so 
Yeah. So what I've got, I'm going to buy one of these at least. Uh, the last two honey juice I've got. Yeah, I'm keeping it in my hand now. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what we have is um, starting from here. This is uh, West Lothian, this is rapeseed, and it's also got other flowers in it too, like wild cherry. It's really, really sweet and it's fruity. This is uh, the West Lothian Sour Blossom. It's the very viscous, really um, uh, silky honey. Uh, it's slightly floral. It's just, uh, it's great, say, if you want to put it on yogurts and things like that. This is the lime honey. This is really citrusy, really mentholic, minty. Uh, this is the multi spring multifloral from this year. It's um, the kind of the bourbon-esque taste, woody and smoky, slightly salty. This is the, the treacle, the, uh, what do we call honeydew. it? Honeydew. The honeydew. Uh, sticky toffee pudding yeah. of the honey world. This is heather honey from Pendleton Hills. So it's got a really nice caramel taste and it's got a nice bitter end on from the Pentlands. And this is uh, from a not mine, but it's from a beekeeper in Glasgow. It's a really floral honey. Um, so it's like eating flowers. Really wonderful. Because in Glasgow, they don't have many trees. And that's one of the distinguishing features of uh, the honey difference between Scotland and uh, uh, Edinburgh and uh, Glasgow. <laughs> it's weird more. And here in Edinburgh, a lot of the honey comes from trees. This is mainly trees, mainly trees. And then as we get into West Lothian, it's more ground-dwelling flowers, uh, shrubs, ground-dwelling flowers. And is the honeycomb all the same? Um, they dark by weight. Um, I mean, type Yeah, these are all yellow clover. So this is the cinnamon tasting honey. Uh, so how much are you for a jar? So each jar is 15. Except that one, which is 20. Which one? This one? And no, the honey, honey juice, juice because yeah. that would only get about 10 jars of it a year. Oh, really? It's very rare. Okay, I'll give it both of these two. Okay. In, in, can you eat the wax? Yeah, these wax is really good for your health. It's uh, high in vitamin A and it's got lots of. Um, get in. <laughs> So, um, is it a light, by the way? No, I'm going to... Uh, oh, yeah. Is it cash or card, sir? Uh, card. Yeah. yeah. So that will be... No, it's a church. What did you get? The Heather one and... Uh, honeydew and the... Honeydew, honeydew and the summer blossom. Mm. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't I actually like, like this one. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's for my partner. Oh. Uh, <laughs> take oh, one well, maybe I'll like this one. <laughs> <laughs> take a kiss. Okay. Thank it's you very much, Ray. It was very What's interesting. Great. Great. Uh, I'm, giving a, a, I'm giving a presentation in a week if you want to come to my one. Yeah, that's <laughs> one. A week today. It's about, I, I built a house. Uh, yeah, I saw that. that one. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> it's here as well. It's here as well. A week yeah. today. It's only one time. Yeah. Yeah. Come, everyone come. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we'll have to now. Uh, it's here uh, we are. See ya. See ya. Which one is the line? one? Uh, this is the line one. Okay. 